Akash Dile and welcome to In Conversation with Tibet TV. This is Sakina Bhatt. Today we have with us a man who is the founder and principal attorney of the law offices of Tenzing Wangel PLLC in New York and Massachusetts. He has also assisted several local non-profit organizations on various legal matters on a pro bono basis. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Tibet Justice Center, Tibetan Political Review and the Treasury of Lives. His name is Tenzing Wangel. Tenzing Wangel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sakina. So Tenzing Wangel, please tell us something about your work. In New York, mm -hmm. uh, I have a law practice. We have four paralegals. I'm the sole attorney. And it was founded in uh, around 2010. And we work with the immigrant community, uh, a lot of the Himalayan immigrant community. And we uh, represent them in their legal needs, with their legal needs. At a very young age, you planned to set up this firm. So what got you this idea? Well, uh, before I went to law school, mm -hmm. uh, I worked as a paralegal for many, many years. I gained enough experience, and I did, a, I did many internships. So over time, I gained uh, the experience, but more importantly, the confidence to know that if I did something like this, if I did go out and open a law practice, that you know, uh, I would be able to do it. How uh, challenging was it for a Tibetan to set up a law firm in the United States? There were a number of challenges. I don't think I could name one, two of those challenges. Yeah, but can you just like say one of the incidents? Sure. Uh, initially, because because I was the first uh, law uh, attorney uh, working in the New York area, there were people who 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 weren't sure if it was a a real law office or if it was someone, you know pretending to be an attorney. Mm -hmm. So there was some initial, people had some preconceptions, prejudices, but we were able to uh, overcome it. And uh, the other thing was uh, my relative youth at that time. I mean, <laughs> people looked at me and they, they, they thought I was a, a young uh, attorney without experience, and I had to contend with that as well. But I think over time, I might have aged uh, or matured a lot in the last few years. Uh, as of now, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Now everything is okay. Everything's fine. Yeah. Yes. So you've studied in India, UK, and the US. So how are the provisions of education different in these three countries? Right. So I think I would take this opportunity to thank my teachers because I did uh, get a very good foundation in early education. Uh, Tibetan Children's Village, both in lower TCV and in upper TCV. Very little resources, but they were able to impart to us a very uh, good education. With that solid foundation, I was able to go to England, the US, pursue my further education. And uh, over time, I think uh, having that solid foundation has stood me in good stead. Being able to combine everything uh, has worked out well. Uh, so what are some of the pressing legal issues the Tibetans in the United States are facing? Right, so when I first started my office, uh, I didn't want to limit myself to just immigration or any other area of law, any other specific mm -hmm. narrow area of law. So I started my practice as a general practice. So when I first advertised my office, I said I would do uh, any area of law. Because when you get a law degree, you pass the bar, you're allowed to practice in any area of law. As of now, I specialize in immigration. Uh, I specialize in family matrimonial law. I do some real estate, some small business. But that really mirrors the needs of the community because I ended up specializing in the very areas that there was a increased need for legal representation. So my areas of expertise or specialization mirror the needs of the Tibetan immigrant, immigrant community. Uh, can you please tell us about one or two cases? In, in general terms, mm -hmm. I can tell you that we have a range of cases. Uh, we have clients who have uh, family matrimonial issues and they come to us with their very personal problems. Sometimes they need um, someone to just listen to them. We also help people who are going through the immigration process, be it uh, asylum, they're applying for asylum in the U.S., which is increasingly becoming more and more difficult in the U.S. The burden of proof is becoming higher and hi higher uh, as of now. So we do a number of cases and in, a, in different areas of law. There's just so many of them that's very difficult to single out any one or two. So are most of your clients Tibetans, or is it open to all? Obviously, our, our law of office is open to any, anyone. Okay. anyone. So mm -hmm. our clientele is comprised of mainly people from the Himalayan immigrant community. 
So uh, we have clients from uh, the Tibetan community, the Himalayan community, be it Nepal, Bhutan, and then we have a lot of non-Himalayan clients as well. And uh, just through word of mouth, if you help a non-Himalayan person, mm -hmm. they tell their other family members. We haven't done any marketing, so it's really word of mouth, and we do have a broad spectrum of clientele. Like but do you do have a website? We do have a website, mm -hmm. and we put it up on some on some uh, public uh, platforms. What I found out was that having a website gets people to know that you are around and that mm -hmm. there's a law office, but in order for people to trust you with their legal issues, that takes time. So uh, now that we've been, uh, we've had this practice for eight years, uh, over time, we've ha we have this increasing number of clients that we've served and they uh, in turn will tell their the family members family. and their circle mm -hmm. and that's how it's grown for us. So you hold free informational seminars of legal interest to the Tibetan communities. Mm -hmm. So what are the main uh, legal topics that mainly cater to the Tibetans? In my experience, I think there's a uh, apathy, indifference uh, by the Tibetan uh, community, in the Tibetan mm -hmm. community towards the legal issues. They treat it as an individual problem and not as a collective problem. I don't see the community as a whole doing much to address legal issues. And I have talked at some seminars, mm -hmm. and uh, most of them happened to be around the time when immigration rules were tightening and people were starting to panic. So it wasn't proactive, it was more reactive, and people were uh, seeking answers when they were panicking for themselves or for a family member. And so I think that has to change. People need to be more proactive because the stakes are just so high. Mm -hmm. And the issues that I've talked about would be immigration. When I do hold these seminars, I think uh, people, once pe people have information, knowledge can be a great source of uh, empowerment. And mm -hmm. they know what their options are. And uh, that goes a long way. So, so how important do you think to hold these seminars and let the Tibetan community know about the legal topics? the organizations. Mm -hmm. I don't think they take an initiative or the responsibility to invite uh, attorneys, lawyers, uh, legal experts, or anyone, right? And without that, the some instances where I have been invited, I've been more than happy to attend and go and talk to people and give them information. Timely information is so valuable. Before, uh, before crisis, if you have information in the form of legal advice, you can avert uh, something very disastrous from happening to oneself, to your family, and, you know, the community as well. So what kind of response do you get from the Tibetan community? Like, what draws the interest in your talks? The one time where I had a lot of people in attendance mm -hmm. was there was a general atmosphere environment of panic when uh, immigration laws were tightening in the U.S. A lot of people feared that there would be deportations and people were fearing for themselves. Mm -hmm. And in many in instances, they were fearing for their family members. Uh, outside of those talks, those public talks, I think a lot of people are now, I'm seeing that more and more people are coming in for consultations, which is very good. And now, uh, so that's the bright side. I mean, there is a silver lining. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, even though there are not that many public talks, I think a lot of educated people, and uh, even if some people are not educated, some people know uh, to seek information ahead of time. So they will come in for consultations uh, and they will try and prevent something from happening. So, so I think there's an increasing number of consultations and that's done at my office. And in many instances, those are free consultations. And then uh, in those instances where I do charge for the consultation, it all goes to nonprofits. So I've supported so many nonprofits, the Tibetan Women's Association, Students for Free Tibet, I mean all kinds of regional associations. And so all the funds that I get from my consultation fees goes into uh, supporting nonprofits because once a nonprofit asks you for a donation, it's very hard to refuse them. Mm -hmm. So I use those funds towards uh, supporting those organizations. <laughs> That's very nice of you, Dr. Ongela. And uh, you have also worked in the Board of Directors for the Tibet Justice Center. Right. So what is your role in that? And how does Tibet Justice Center, what do they do in advancing justice for the Tibetan community or the Tibetans? So I think... Uh, Tibet Justice Center used to be called the International Committee of Lawyers for Tibet. Mm -hmm. So it's been in uh, existence for a really long time. 
and initially their goal was to uh, do research, put out reports uh, establishing or demonstrating that Tibet was a sovereign country, Tibet's right to self-determination. They've also assisted a lot of Tibetans in the U.S. or anywhere around the world that are seeking asylum. We've done a lot of work in India uh, looking at the refugee situation. We've done a lot of work in uh, Nepal looking at the Tibetan refugee situation. And we put out reports mm -hmm. to show how dire the situation is. So that would counter some views that the situation of Tibetan refugees is very uh, rosy. And we put out reports showing what the situation is, that there is a, still a need for you know, people, non-government organizations, and, and, and governments to support the Tibetan people. Uh, what does it require for an individual to follow one's dream and pursue in one's own field? I think there's two parts to the question. Uh, one is starting something, and the other one is sustaining it. And in my experience, uh, those are two s separate sets of challenges. As of now, my challenge has been to sustain what we've built. And I think what it requires is having a vision, uh, having a plan. Uh, before I started my law office, I actually drew up a business plan, and ha I had many people uh, you know, more knowledgeable than me look at it and give me advice on how I could better my business plan. And then the next thing I've learned is to sustain what you've created is you need a good team, right? And to have a good team, uh, you know, you find talent, you nurture talent, and I've learned that uh, whatever you have to do, you know, you can seek other people's advice, but in the end, you just have to forge your own path, you know, go on your own journey, and know how important your work is, because if you don't know how important your work is, if you don't know how indispensable your work is, then it's not as meaningful. So in my, in my office, I know how important my work is. Uh, I know what I don't do or what I do can have a huge uh, impact on the lives of my clients and their families. So that's why, that's what keeps me going and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm very happy with what I do. So finally, is there anything you want to say? Uh, nothing specific, but uh, just uh, related to the 550, I'm very pleased that I got to attend. It was very encouraging to see a lot of young people, so talented, so promising, and so uh, dedicated and passionate. So I draw a lot of energy and inspiration from that. Okay, thank you, Kenzu Ongela. Thank it you. was uh, really nice to have this conversation with you today. Okay, thank you, Sakina. Thank you so much for watching, and see you in our very next episode of In Conversation with Tibet TV. Mm -hmm.